Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's Seed World Strategy webinar. My name is Alex Martin and I serve as editor for Seed World Magazine and today I'm absolutely happy to be your host. Today we're looking at a very fun but a very hypothetical situation. What a global green deal would look like. If you're unfamiliar with the European Green Deal, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on it. Um, it is a piece, the, the European Green Deal is a piece of climate legislation made to transform the EU into a modern resource, efficient and com competitive economy. And in addition, the EU believes the Green Deal is their lifeline out of the pandemic and that the EU's seven-year budget will be financing the Green Deal. But our, our expert panelists are going to help us learn a little bit more about this as we um, and hopefully help teach us three things by the end of the webinar, which is um, how the Green Deal positioned and the how is the Green Deal positioned in the global policy of landscape of food and agriculture? How would a Green Deal affect global agriculture and whether or not climate smart policies can help stand the test of time as we continue forward in our world? Um, just so you know, we will be live tweeting during today's webinar, so if you'd like to join our conversation, please use the hashtag, hashtag SWStrategyWebinar to connect with us. We'd also like, like to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and it's going to be made available at SeedWorld.com following the proceedings in the next day or two. And since this is a panel, we'd really like to encourage you all to ask questions when you have them. I'll make sure to filter those questions to the correct panelists during our discussion. Now we are going to bring in our expert panel. So today I'd like to present you with two panelists. We are joined by Syngenta's Petra Lopes, um, the head of business sustainability of Syngenta Crop Production, and Kent Nadozi, who is Secretary of the FAO's International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. I'd like to thank both of you for joining me, and um, we're going to have a little bit more of a brief introduction uh, to the Green Deal. But before we get to that, I'd like to let Petra and Kent kind of do some introductions themselves. So Petra, um, let's start with you. Would you mind giving us a little bit of your background and um, share a little bit about what you do at Syngenta? <laughs> Absolutely. Good afternoon, good morning, everybody, depending on where you are. Um, Alex, you introduced me as the head of business sustainability in Syngenta Crop Protection. And in this role, I have three responsibilities. One is the regulatory, so the market authorization for our products. Second is the public affairs. And third is what you would expect behind this title, the sustainable and responsible business. And this is in essence about integrating sustainability into the whole crop construction strategy, because we want to be the global leader in plant health innovation, helping growers improve farm productivity and sustainability. Um, before my global role, I've been leading the EAMA, so the European Business Sustainability, where I have been representing both seeds and crop protection. So this might be the reason why I'm here today. And actually, my history, professional background is in healthcare, and there, there are surprising similarities with agriculture. Maybe two more words about Syngenta. We want to enable farmers to feed the growing population within the boundaries of the planet. And our purpose is we, we, bring the, we do this by bringing solutions and protect, sorry, by bringing the solutions and products that protect crops. And we are one of the world's largest seed developers as well. At the heart of our work is the idea of tying together business sustainability and with the, with the profit of the farm so that we can create value for all stakeholders, the farmers, the employees, and the suppliers, the food chain partners, and the communities where we work, as well as society at large. So this is a bit about me and about Syngenta. Perfect. Thank you so much, Petra. Uh, and Kim, I'd like to throw it over to you. Would you mind introducing yourself and what you do at the FAO as well? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Alex, uh, <clears throat> for this. Uh, my name is Kent Naduzi, as Alex had uh, indicated there. Uh, I work for FAO, uh, so I head the structure of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. Uh, the main objectives of this international agreement uh, covers 
uh, the conservation, sustainable use, and having access to genetic resources that we need to breed crops that will address some of the challenges that we are facing today, whether they be environmental or man-made crisis. So we believe that uh, is true conserving the genetic diversity of crops that we can address those um, challenges. And uh, we do not conserve them just for the sake of conserving, but conserving for use and ensure that we use them sustainably so that they contribute to food security and sustainable agriculture. So my background is in law. I have a PhD in law from McGill University. Uh, dealing, uh, my focus had been on the international governance of genetic resources, you can guess, but um, now, I've also worked in the environmental uh, sector uh, and uh, environmental related issues uh, throughout uh, in my past um, uh, roles in different uh, institutions and and, um, uh, and contexts. So thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to the conversation this afternoon. Yes, thank you, Ken, so much. And like I mentioned, I'd like to give you a couple of more numbers before we dive into the questions for Kent and Petra. Just a couple of more numbers on how. Uh, the Green Deal is affecting agriculture um, in Europe currently. So when we talk about the European Green Deal, there are three goals the European Commission set out for this um, piece of policy. It's no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050, economic growth decouples from resource use and no person and no place left behind. In addition, the Commission believes that this will create fresh air, clean water, healthy soil, and more biodiversity in Europe, as well as healthy and affordable food options. But particularly, if you've heard of the Green Deal, probably the portion that you've heard most about is the farm to pork portion, which um, most of the actions for agriculture stem from. The proposals are to make the EU's climate, energy, transport, and taxation policies fit for reducing net greenhouse ga gas emissions by 55% by 2030, Part of that includes reducing the use of pesticides on crops, fruits, and vegetables by 50%. In addition, it wants to reduce nutrient losses by 50% while ensuring no deterioration in soil fertility to eventually reduce soil, uh, reduce fertilizer use by 20% by 2030. And finally, the last number I want to leave you with before we dive in is that Farm to Fork is targeting for at least 25% of EU's agriculture land to be designated under organic farming and increase um, in organic aquaculture by 2030. So that's a a lot going on. Um, our experts know a lot more about it than I do. But with that, let's go ahead and um, dive into some questions. And as always, um, feel free to um, add on to any other questions, Petra, and if there's one that kind of tickles your fancy. So Kent, I'd like to start with you. We know that the FAO is a specialized agency of the United Nations that um, leads international efforts to defeat hunger. Um, you know, you have 195 members, 194 countries, and the European Union who works together closely with you worldwide. Um, what commonalities does FAO's mission share with the EU Green Deal? Okay, thank you. you. Yes, I'm um, audible now. Okay, indeed. Yes, thank you. Let me start uh, by saying that uh, the Green Deal is one of the most ambitious sustainability enactment in recent times, both in terms of geographical reach, the scope and the policy uh, scope that it covers. Uh, it addresses issues related to health, food security, environmental integrity, as well as climate change. Uh, provides how to boost food production while mitigating climate change and protecting the environment. On the other hand, the goal of FAO as an institution is to achieve food security for all and make sure that people have regular access to enough high quality food to lead active, healthy lives. In this COVID context, uh, I wouldn't call it post COVID because uh, it was still in the COVID context. The, the EU Green Deal aims to build our society's resilience to the future threats. And then also to address the current threat that we're, we're under. Uh, food insecurity is one of those threats. Hence, the fundamental role of agriculture, which the EU Green Deal reflects, is in its form, uh, is essentially in its form to fork strategy that you mentioned earlier. So in this context, if I have to mention or identify one core shared proposition that the EU Green Deal has with FAO, 
it is one word, sustainability. FAO is con you know, committed to paving the way for more sustainable agriculture and food systems and to delivering healthy food and prosperity for all while pre you know, preserving our climate's natural resources. So the question of sustainability is at the core of the Green Deal and is in fact a core value proposition of EU's farm to fork uh, strategy and as well as the biodiversity strategy, which are components of the EU Green Deal. So in that respect, uh, there are shared values with the FAO, uh, ensuring uh, sustainable agriculture, food security, and environmental integrity. Perfect. Thanks so much, Kent. And Petra, I mean, you get a, a very different perspective for us today, a business perspective. So I wanted to see if you've experienced any changes since the European Green Deal was enacted, or um, I should I should rephrase that, maybe has Syngenta experienced any changes since the EU enacted the Green Deal? You know, our approach or our strategy is actually not affected by the Green Deal, but it rather confirms what our um, purpose is, whether it is in our investment in innovation or whether it is in our sustainability plan, which we call Good Growth Plan. So for us, business and sustainability go hand in hand. Or in other words, nowadays, no business can be sustainable without a strong foundation and sustainability. Um, when it comes to the Green Deal, we believe we can change the way farming is done in Europe um, with a focus on sustainable and climate-friendly solutions that deliver for farmers, consumers, and industry. Now, that said, recent studies have actually revealed some un serious unintended consequences of the Green Deal's approach to setting targets for the reduction of crop protection and fertilizer use. Um, there are various impact assessments available which say that we expect lower yields, higher food prices, unviable incomes for farmer and fewer opportunities to export, produce. These are the conclusions of a recent impact assessment from bargaining and university. We cannot ignore this data and we certainly cannot trade off good outcome intentions with such problematic consequences. And in Syngenta, we would like to see an approach that doesn't simply set targets or trade off productivity versus environmental goals, but we rather need a comprehensive view of how food systems work and we need to look at the practical solutions taking into account realities of food production. For the EU, this means looking at how we can use the Green Deal framework to accelerate innovation and bring sustainable solutions to farmers faster. From, from an innovator business perspective, speed to market is critical. It currently takes us up to 11 years for any crop protection substance to arrive on the market and pests and diseases are not waiting. We need to see a broad choice of new chemical pesticides, biological products, available for farmers with a modern fast-track risk-based regulatory system. Um, so the Green Deal policy actually, if you look at the business um, needs, needs to enable efficient pathways to market for the innovations that help achieve both productivity and sustainability. Perfect. Thank you so much for both of you. Um, now, Kent. We know that the, the EU enacted the Green Deal um, with biodiversity as one of its focus areas. Um, and biodiversity, as you already mentioned in your introduction, is something you're quite passionate about. So can you tell us more about the FAO's vision of biodiversity and how it relates to the Green Deal um, as, uh, as it continues to develop and how you're working with it? Yeah, thank you. Um, the EU 2030 uh, biodiversity strategy does not view biodiversity in isolation from other policy macro objectives. Uh, in line with the approach of sustainable development goals of the United Nations, the strategy is intended to produce benefits for both planet and for people. So FAO also follows that same approach. It views biodiversity as vital to improving agricultural and food production for humans while maintaining our planet's resources and ecosystems. 
So FAO's report on the state of the world's biodiversity for food and agriculture, for instance, showed that loss of biodiversity or loss of diversity poses a serious risk to global food security by undermining the resilience of many agricultural systems. So FAO members are convinced that um, uh, the, you know about the importance of biodiversity and maintaining biodiversity. They adopted the FAO strategy on mainstreaming biodiversity across agricultural sectors and are implementing it across their food systems. So we have um, in this context, uh, you know, compelling evidence that suggests that more and more action is being taken to safeguard biodiversity and sustainably manage our natural resources. So there is um, one aspect of the Green Deal uh, and biodiversity I would like to touch upon, and that is the possible synergies between the Green Deal and international biodiversity conventions and uh, agreements. So measures in the biodiversity strategy address the global biodiversity crisis by looking at ambitious as well as concerted action on a global scale, not just within the EU, taking advantage of um, what already exists and functions as well in terms of multilateral instruments and processes. So for example, I'll say the strategy refers to new global biodiversity framework under the Convention on Biological Diversity that is currently being negotiated and is at the last stages of uh, such a negotiation before the next conference of parties. So the FAO International Plan Treaty that I serve targets the diversity of seeds and underplanting material for food production for food security as well as uh, sustainable agriculture. So the International Plan Treaty is in harmony with the Convention on Biological Diversity and expect that it to be connected to the new global biodiversity framework. So the EU strategy um, that deals with biodiversity forming part of the Green Deal does not, uh, as I said at the, at the beginning, uh, look at biodiversity in isolation, but also is linked to both the climate to issues related to climate change, but also uh, food security and uh, sustainable agriculture. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kent. Now, Petra, I think you've kind of already, for my next question, brought up some of the, the different points of view and um, feedback some of uh, some institutions might be giving um, in response to the Green Deal. But I wanted to ask you, what has been the feedback across the industry uh, of the, the Green Deal and farm to fork in agriculture? Um, how are farmers feeling about the, the limitations or, or possibly even new opportunities with these policies? Um, thanks, Alex. I, I think um, when it comes to farmers, you know, it's really important that it's achievable and that it works for them. And it being achievable, achievable meaning the targets need to be realistic and they need to have the tools. Um, to achieve the targets and they need to have a livelihood at the end of the day because they also need to look at the sustainability of their own um, their own operations right and currently we believe that some of the targets being set are not yet aligned with what actually needs to be achieved which is what I said both productivity and sustainability and uh, there's certainly some some room for for improvement and an area where we see improvement is actually um, uh, let me comment on your previous question alex on the biodiversity so the european union is tomorrow also releasing the draft law on biodiversity and the targets which are in there are actually um, pretty nicely constructed they focus on the real objective which is protecting species increasing biodiversity um, on farmland and um, on on farm, and it's a nice set of outcome indicators that it's listed in this um, regulation, and this will then allow competition, competition of all stakeholders to achieve these um, targets, and that's much nicer than some process targets like a reduction of fertilizer or crop protection, which is a problem for farmers, for example, because they have no alternative tools available now. Um, the innovation is still slow in the field, and uh, they, they don't know how, how actually achieve their productivity targets while not having the tools to um, to actually um, um, produce the crops they the world needs. 
Thank you, Petra. I think that's very uh, well said to, to hear some of that feedback. Um, can, shifting a little bit more, um, I'm glad Petra brought biodiversity back into the, the mix because um, one of the questions I haven't gotten to ask you yet that I think you kind of went into a little bit of detail with already is just, um, you know, a, a, one of the main focuses with the FAO's International Plant Treaty is um, a baseline for benefit, uh, or excuse me, access and benefit sharing of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. How would you like to see the, the treaty fit into the Green Deal, um, if at all? Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, as I said at the start, I mean, there's also there are some you know definite overlap and, and um, shared values uh, with the Green Deal, which is uh, food security and sustainable agriculture. Uh, at the same time, the International Plant Treaty is part of the international regime on access and benefit sharing for genetic resources, and is um, you know this uh, process that started with the Convention on Biological Diversity in the mid '90s. So the so-called uh, ABS uh, sectors has its conceptual and practical specificities you know, within a broader environmental framework and is undergoing real transformation, especially driven by technological evolution that has changed the ways that genetic resources are used. So essentially, uh, genetic resources are digital, digitalized. They are used as data or with data or from data and benefit sharing needs also to reflect this reality. Uh, in my opinion, it is um, this transformation of, if, of um, if this transformation is successful, ABS under the international treaty can constitute an important contribution to agricultural sector by addressing issues related to equity that is uh, really um, not directly addressed. Uh, you know, within the, the, the Green Deal, as far as it concerns access to genetic uh, resources. So the so-called um, green economy is a very, you know, mission-oriented mission and result-driven um, goal, and often equity lags behind in this regard. So this regard for the specific circumstances of um, developing countries or indigenous peoples or local communities really raises equity uh, concerns in, the, in that context. So um, in a nutshell, I would like to see the international plan to fit into the Green Deal by equitably addressing global environmental challenges through allocation of economic and social cultural advantages arising from the use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, uh, as well as um, in taking into account the needs and the specificities of the different uh, stakeholders which includes farmers, researchers, plant breeders, as well as uh, marketers. So all this without losing its functional relevance in terms of the distribution of seeds and other genetic material, as well as accessibility to plant data worldwide. So there is a need to take into account all the needs and, 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 the, and, the, um, and the context of the different stakeholders uh, in, the, in the entire value chain of genetic resources use. Um, and access to them. Thank you. Great. No, thank you, Kent, for that. Um, yes. So, Petra, going back to um, you, have mentioned sustainability when talking about the Green Deal. Kent has mentioned sustainability when talking about the the Green Deal and FAO. Um, but in your opinion, Petra, um, agriculture knows sustainability is important and that we need to move to a more sustainable future. But do you think the agriculture industry needs policies like the Green Deal to help regulate and continue towards this more sustainable future that we're all aiming for? That's a that's a really good question, you know, and typically you would you would believe as a business less regulation is is best, but Actually, I, I believe, and we have seen this, that not just for agriculture, but for all sectors, we require sound public policy and planning to guide the transition the planet needs, the transition to more climate-friendly practices and approaches. It's, it's not going to happen with the change in incentive, the change in approaches. Um, so all of us, industry, farmers, civil society, and government have major parts to play. And so policies like the Green Deal are meant to orchestrate all of this. 
uh, in, in a common direction because it doesn't work if society expects something different from farmers than the market expects. Yeah? Um, and it must be practical. So with the food security a major concern and rising prices, it's critical that we take a realistic approach and the policy needs to safeguard the integrity of Europe's agricultural sector and ensure it remains economically robust and competitive for future generations. So again, we believe that the policies of the Green Deal need to help farmers and growers to adapt, but also ensure that they maintain a good livelihood and produce enough to feed the people. Yes, we absolutely need see the need for climate policies, but they need to be framed in a way that looks at how to achieve targets as opposed to just having targets for targets. Perfect. Um, very, very well said. Um, and actually, Petra, I apologize. I'm going to hit you with another question right now. But um, Kent, if you would like to jump in on this one, please feel free to as well. But this is my hypothetical question of the day. Um, do you think that it would be, or sorry, excuse me, what do you think the, the world would look like if there was a globally enacted Green Deal? Do you think that's a feasible endeavor? Do you think that's something that might hinder, as you said, farmers making a livelihood and um, feeding farmers across the globe? Um, I think... You wanted to, me to answer first. So, um, yeah. look, it is it is super to have um, overarching global aims. You know, as we see this with the global climate targets, the Paris targets, for example, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So, so there is a lot. Um, I mean, we have one planet, and we need global targets. That's very clear. But when it comes to specific policies, we would probably prefer regional approaches, where again there's competition on how to on how to reach the objectives. Agriculture has very much needs to be considered in the local context. Um, climate is different, um, soil is different. And um, so there are very different challenges farmers face around the world. And so we believe if there was a global green deal, it would need to look very different from place to place. Thank you so much. Ken, I'm not sure if you had any other thoughts as well to add on Kent. Yeah, yes, indeed. Uh, I wanted to come in there as well because it's, I think it's also important to have a global framework that would, you know, would bring it all together. Because at the end of the day, while we have national boundaries, biodiversity, and as well as climate crisis, knows no boundaries. So, invariably, such, you know, cross-boundary and international challenges need uh, multilateral approaches to deal with them. So, having some form of framework that uh, facilitates international cooperation. And 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 um, our collaboration and coordination is uh, quite quite helpful in that in, the, in this respect. We have the Paris Agreement, for instance, related to climate change, uh, and now there's a negotiation under the Convention on Biological Diversity, a global framework on biodiversity. But the problem with that, uh, as I think Petra pointed out about the agricultural sector, is that when issues relate to agricultural systems, it is not as simple as uh, as that. The agricultural systems are very complex. So the previous approaches, or even some of the approaches currently, are tended to be fragmented, and one cannot optimize a system by simply optimizing the component elements individually or in isolation. So which is why having you know a systems approach, uh, which I think on the on the pins the, the green deal has a fair chance of truly making a difference, and the kind of difference that we see, you know that we seek, because it's, it tries to involve different sectors, different geographies, different players, different levels of, of the society, whether it's private sector, farmers, local communities, as well as uh, intergovernmental institutions to, to do so. So I think in that respect, it's quite useful to have some form of uh, framework or platform for, for inter interchanges between government and, and different uh, stakeholders. Great, thank you both for, for those insights. Um, Petra, I know we've kind of touched on this a little bit because we talked about farmer feedback that you've been hearing so far from, from the, the Green Deal, but I wanted to look a little bit more uh, closely at some of these restrictions that, that Farm to Fork has put on um, growers and the tools they can use in the field. Um, I know things like pesticides and fertilizers have been kind of put under the microscope. Have you seen that impact on any of your customers or have you seen um, potentially alternative 
solutions to these tools being used? Yes, absolutely. So we, we see impact in, in Europe, not only from the Green Deal now, but from the increasing demands on authorization of crop protection. And many, many compounds have been banned in Europe that are still available in other geographies. And so it has become increasingly difficult for farmers in Europe, for example, to grow sugar beets or oilseed rape because some of the, of the tools are missing. Now, what is does this mean for us? We look at providing alternatives, right? We are fully committed to leading the advancements in agriculture that allow growing the variety of crops that, that um, we need. And one area where we are investing a lot is biopesticides, for example, but also digital technologies or the new breeding techniques to produce um, better seed. Um, we want with these solutions help farmers grow the crops most efficiently while mitigating climate change, restoring soil health and increasing biodiversity. When we look at biopesticides, they are a complement to chemical pesticides, sometimes even a replacement, and they will help uh, in the integrated pest management schemes to lower the exposure to chemical pesticides and to lower the residues. And so this is the key thing society wants and this is what we are for to provide. Great, thank you so much, Petra. I'm looking at our time and I think we have enough time for two questions, one for each of you. So um, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep on that. Uh, but if I see an audience question, if anyone in the audience has any questions, feel free to go ahead and ask them and I'll uh, direct that into my questions as well. But Kent, we, we talked a lot about um, biodiversity and how seed also factors into that, um, into the, the idea of the Green Deal. But how can the seed sector contribute to a global Green Deal? What do you think the seed sector needs to, to do to make um, climate policies a little bit more feasible from a global aspect? Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very uh, yeah, great question. So, in a global global green deal, I would say food production systems are to reduce the ne negative impacts on biodiversity and climate change. They must become more resilient to the current and to future impacts of climate change, learning from good practices to promote transformative adaptation policies, plans, and actions. So, the unavoidable consequence for agriculture is that food production is no longer exclusively the goal of ag the agriculture sector. And since seeds are the building blocks for the diversification of food systems, the challenge for the sector comes with this di diversification of policy objectives. So you have issues of nutrition, equity, as, as I mentioned before, cultural you know, values, agro-biodiversity, climate resilience, climate mitigation, are all policy objectives that are associated to the agriculture sector and thus the seed uh, sector as uh, by, by natural extension. So however, uh, reconciling these different objectives remains a challenge, no doubt. So I think um, notably in seed and crop diversity sector, I think where the classical division, you know, become, you know, especially between say, for instance, um, the, the formal and informal seed systems still predicates some of the policy discussions that we have where some of the binary visions, you know, formal versus informal, uh, one is, you know, uh, system is one that, but we have others as well, such as the traditional farmers versus say, you know, industrial breeders, gym banks versus institute conservation. All this um, binary, you know, dichotomy somewhat undermine the generation of um, the plurality of solutions that, uh, that instead of neglecting that take diverse seed systems as a basis to respond to the diversity of challenges of the food production systems. So in, in, in this context, um, I think one of the research that uh, I think Sirat carried out, Sirat in France, carried out quite recently, uh, shows that a holistic, um, pluralistic approach to seed and crop diversity system is needed to organize the coexistence of the different uh, food production uh, systems in order to enhance the participation of different communities of actors, you know, which manage crop diversity differently, but in a very complementary manner. So it is only by really embracing this uh, plurality 
and coexistence that the seed sector can truly be part of a global uh, green deal. Thank you. Perfect. No, thank you, Ken. I think that was very well said as well. And um, Petra, I'm going to leave the last question up to you. And it's kind of, um, it's similar to Kim, but it's kind of the opposite to, of his. I, I'd like to ask you, what would be your advice to policy makers and regulatory bodies as they continue thinking of climate driven policies like the Green Deal in the future? What, what would you want them to know from the business side of things. I think climate policies are, can be a great tool to encourage innovation because I believe we need innovation and technology to achieve our climate and biodiversity objectives. And, and like you can, I see this going this going hand in hand. And if, if you get this right, this is a unique chance to accelerate the introduction of new approaches and how farmers will grow our food. And so, for example, as we haven't talked about seeds so much in, in Syngenta uh, context here, in Syngenta we are looking into new genomic techniques and the opportunities they bring for environmental and productivity benefits. So we are looking how can we breed seeds that are drought resistant, that, do, that uh, use less fertilizer, that are resistant against certain uh, pests that come with climate change into more regions. So these are all questions which are out there where we want to contribute. And climate policies, if they get it right, can really accelerate and bring the incentives for innovation through, through returns and uh, market access that is being um, allowed in a way, in a way that we can help farmers achieve the objectives the society and the planet want. So so that's my plea. You know, consider climate policies as innovation and ableist. I think that's very well said as well, um, Petra. I I am glad to hear it sounds like everyone is on the same page in that that both both governing bodies and, and businesses are working together to try to make this um, sustainable future for agriculture um, feasible for the, the, the future. Um, but that is unfortunately all the time we have today for questions. Um, I'd like to give our speakers one last big thank you, Petra and Kent, thank you again for participating. And for everyone in our audience uh, watching at home, I really hope you found some of this information of value. And if you missed any part of this recording at all, please know um, that again, a recording of this webinar is going to be made available later this week at seedworld.com. And we'll have an article going with this uh, webinar as well that you should watch out for too. Um, thanks again to everyone who joined us and we hope to see you next time. This is Alex Martin of Seed World signing off. Bye-bye everyone.